our hands together. Celebrate Jesus for Pastor yes. Shadrach Muindi Mbithi. Come on, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Yes. You can do better than that. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Buona sifiri. Buona sifiri tena. Um, it's a um, great privilege to be here. Let's um, pray, and then we'll hear the word of God. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that when we were still sinners, you reconcile us to yourself, that we may be called sons. And we thank you that you use um, works of clay, imperfect beings like man to present the infallible unchanging, perfect um, word. The perfect word that revives the soul. The perfect word that brings light to the eyes. The perfect word that makes wise the simple and by these words are your servants warned. Lord, may we desire it than anything else may may it be more to be desired than than gold than much pure gold may it be sweeter to our lips like honey than honey from its comb then by it O oh lord will we be warned from great transgressions may the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you O oh lord my god and my redeemer this we ask for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have your seats. Thank you, present worship team. Let's appreciate the present worship team for the good job that they are doing. Thank you, guys. Um, I think I'll start with some introductions. My name is Shadrach Muindi Mbidi. I am born again. Christ is Lord and Savior in my life. I fellowship and serve at Deliverance Church, Kaha Sukari. Um, yeah, it's a good thing. It's a great opportunity that the Lord has allowed me to serve there. I am married to one Dorcas Wanjiro. We have a son called Rael Shani Muindi. Uh, three months now. Yeah. Um, I have always been wondering why babies are called a bundle of joy. Um, our story about this baby wasn't all joy, so I think it's a wrong uh, description to call them a bundle of joy alone. Joy should be in the statement, but it should not be the first one. So it's a bundle of diapers, crying, sleepless nights, and so many other things, and then joy. So we bless the Lord that God has worked on us through this son. We thought we were parenting him, but he has been parenting us. He has taught us patience, and we bless the Lord for that. My wife wanted to be here, but we, she woke up sick, so she couldn't make it. But all is well. Thank you, Cristiano, for reciting this scripture. Um, and the challenge to us all is to keep this word hidden in our hearts. Um, Psalms 118 says, how can a young man keep his ways pure? It answers itself and says it is by living according to the word of God. And then he says that this word have I hidden in my heart that I will not sin against you. The only way we will stay away from evil and sin if is if we hide the word of God in our hearts. And I pray that that's the challenge of each and every one of us, that we will desire with our hearts and with everything that we have to hide the word of God in our hearts. We have been doing a study of the book of Ephesians. Um, Pastor Francis 
has been taking us through the morning expositions and amazing things have been happening. Then yesterday, Pastor Jack taught us on redemption, covering um, Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 3 all the way to uh, 6, and really taught us about the importance that the, it is by the blood of Jesus that we are redeemed. It is this blood that gives us and that, and has, that has accomplished for us the gift of salvation so that we can be called sons. We have been adopted in the kingdom of God. And he says that it was planned even before time that God would give his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. Today we want to talk about the extent of sin, something that he touched about and, and say that we cannot understand the holiness of God if we do not also understand the extent of sin. See, you cannot know how sinful you are unless you know how holy the God that we sin against is. And that was taught yesterday. And then today in the morning, Pasi uh, did again another run through focusing on different themes in the book of Ephesians. And I pray that as we listen to the word of God today, we will be able to understand him and love him more. Because I think a bad picture, a bad picture of God pollutes our worship for him. So that if you do not know him, you will not worship him in truth and in spirit. Look at the emphasis of this scripture. Truth. Truth is in knowledge. So that you have to know to worship. Because I believe knowledge creates intimacy. The more I have, I have continued to know the Lord, the more I have loved him the more I have desired to love him and, and to serve him. It is only when you know the Lord that you know what to do to honor and glorify him and please him more. So our topic is the extent of sin, or if you like it, the sinfulness of sin, or if you like it, the radical depravity of sin. Um, in our sharing today, I have three objectives. Objective number one, I will labor to explain the meaning of sin from scripture. Number two also, I will explain the extent of sin from scripture. And number three, I will show us the remedy of sin um, stroke the hope of the gospel in scripture. For us to understand sin, we have to get to where it first began. And this takes us to the book of Genesis chapter 3, where a man falls. And I will just do a small background check of this doctrine of sin. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 3 that now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? See, if you are keen, you will know that it is, that is not what God actually said. God did not say that you you should not eat of any tree. The first thing that the serpent does is to present doubt in the heart of the woman. Who are we doubting here? We are doubting the goodness of God. The first sin that was co committed in the Garden of Eden was against God and it was against his good nature. And the devil presents God as a fun killer, a God that exists to give us do's and, 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 and don'ts, a God that exists to give us guidelines and limitations to that which we think we want to do. And the devil comes and presents this in the eye of the woman, and so the woman questions the authenticity 
of God. He questions whether, she questions whether God is actually true and good in that which he had said. I believe that that the, 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 the scripture that says you shall not eat from the garden in the middle of the, uh, from the tree in the middle of the garden was enough scripture for Adam and Eve to live a perfect, holy, good life if they had only obeyed it. But then the devil presents doubt and they doubt. Verse 4 continues and says this, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. See, after doubt has been presented to God, to, to, to the woman, sorry. After doubt has been presented to the woman, the devil continues and presents another option for the woman. God had already spoken and said that you will surely die. But then the devil makes the woman doubt God even further by saying you will not die. What is, an, what is in question here? The thing that is in question here is the judgment and the justice nature of our God. He had stated it, that you will die if you disobey. But then, the woman disobeys, and the justice of God is in stake. And most of the times when we fall into sin, when we fall into temptation, when we choose our desires above God's decrees, we question his judgment. So at the center of every sinner, at the center of all the things that you struggle with, is a questioning of the judgment of God. So sin has been presented, and guess what? The, 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 the woman... The Bible says, seeing that the tree was fit, it was appealing to the eye. It was fit to be eaten and admirable. She plucks it, eats it, and gives some to the husband who was standing there. Most of us have been presented with a story of the fall that does not have Adam in the picture. And we think that Adam was not there. One of the dangers of the fall is that men became passive. Men do not want to take responsibilities. Men struggle with saying things. Men struggle with taking initiatives. And that is why right now in our country we have homes that have no fathers. Absent fathers. It is a result of the fall, friends. And so this happens when the woman gives the plant, the, the fruit to the man and the man eats it. They realize, the Bible says their eyes are open and they realize they are naked. And they hide. When they hide, another thing they do, they doubt the omnipresence of God. What Pasi was telling us, that Joseph, when he was tempted by Potiphar, he said he will not do such a thing against his God. Because he knew no one may see this but God. So they hid, questioning the omnip om om omnipresence of God. They, they questioned that God is there and that God knows and that God will see them. And do you think when our God is asking them, where are you? He does not know. He knows. He knows, friends. So some of us, when we are doing the things we do in darkness, do not think that the Lord does not know. The Lord actually sees you. He knows what you have hidden in that phone that has so many passwords. He knows. He knows the kind of text that you write when you are hiding yourself under the blankets. He knows. He knows the things you do in your secret places. He knows. So at behind every scene is a questioning of the omniscience of God. 
That is why I said, if you know the God that we sin against, you will revere him, you will love him, you will respect him, you will adore, honor him, desire to live a pure, holy life, much more because of knowledge, because knowledge creates intimacy. And then, after there, it is sliding upon sliding. God asks Adam, where are you? What, what have you just done? Again, something happens. Adam blames God. Adam has the audacity to say, it is this woman you gave me. So, two things happen there as a result of this sin. Number one, the relationship between God and man is broken. And number two, the relationship between man and fellow man also breaks. Because Adam blames God and then Eve. Adam blames God of the woman that God had given them. So there is tension, there is a blame game that is there. So this separation of man and Adam, man and God, is what is called death. So God actually says you will surely die. They do not die instantly. For sure. Sindo. They do not die. Sinukweli. See, the story continues. But then they eventually die. Listen, when God was creating man, death was not in the picture. Men were created to live forever. Men were created to live eternally. But when they sinned, God had mercy on them and allowed death. So death is mercy. I will explain. Death is God's mercy to a sinful generation. Why is it mercy? It would be so wrong for God to allow us to live eternally in places where there is sickness, in places where thorns sprout, in places where we had to toil for our food. So God, in his mercy, allows death. And then, there is the death, the spiritual death. Man, becomes totally deprived of anything good. That anything good you do, if it is not centered in Jesus Christ, it becomes an extension of your selfishness. That is why some of us are so willing to give out things so that people can say, oh, nani ni mzuri. That is why when we go to children's home, we go with cameras. And then after we have given everything we came with, we post them in our social media platforms so that we can have a name tagged to what we did. Selfishness. This separation from God caused man to be so selfish that he cannot choose anything, anything good by himself. Nothing good nothing good. That is why we are so prone to sin. Our hearts are attracted by sin. The reason why we have not memorized scripture is because we are attracted to sin. The reason why our lambes is hitting, it is because it is sin. Our hearts are attracted to such things. The reason why our ladies nowadays, all the clothes they wear are thighs day out, is sin. Sin became the center of everything. Sin defined man. Naturally, we are born in sin. If you do not believe in the doctrine of the origin of sin, that we are born in sin, come to my house and see my small boy. 
such a small boy, three months, but he knows how to manipulate his ways. Who taught him? The nature of sin. David actually says that we are born in sin. I was conceived in sin. And we are living in a generation where no one wants to be told they are bad. We all think we are good. Friends, you are not good. And if you are good, your goodness would not earn you eternity. Because it was not perfect. It was mad with sin. So man falls. And all of the generations after man become born in sin. And hence now the Bible talks about and you were in Ephesians chapter 2 and you were dead in transgressions and sin. You are dead. You are dead. You couldn't do anything by yourself. You couldn't save yourself. You couldn't. Some of us think we are so good that we deserved salvation. You could not. Actually, the thought that you are good, you deserved salvation, is enough sin. The young people who are here, friends, let me tell you something. You are not a good person. You are not. We have been deceived to that you are a good person. I heard Joel Austin once say that 99% of humans are good. They are not. The Bible is against that. They are not good people. We are told we are born in sin. We are not good. We are far from good. For us to be good, we have to redefine goodness. To measure up to that standard and attain it, we have to redefine it. So I, I will start by defining what sin is. Number one, this is what sin is. Sin is lack of conformity to God's will in attitude, in thought, or in action. Lack of conformity to God's will in attitude, thought, or in action. Whether committed actively or passively. I repeat, lack of conformity to God's will in attitude, thoughts, or action, whether committed actively or passively. So for you to be, to claim you are a Christian and all your friends are watching or listening to secular music or they are going clubbing and you know this and you have not told them you are partaking in their sin and so you are a sinner also. For you to know that your friends are stealing an exam and you do not report them to the teacher, you are a sinner also. For you to know friends who are sleeping around and you are not doing anything about it, you are sinning with them also. Because it is actively and passively. Things that you do and things that you do not do. I'll explain and continue saying that at the center of all sin is a replacing of God with self. At the center of all sin is replacing God with self. We look at the sin of Adam and Eve. They are told they will be like God and they replace the sufficiency of God with thinking that they are sufficient by themselves and they can, they can do without God. Most of the times when we sin, most of the time, young man, when you do the things you do in your secret places, you have thought in your heart that you are okay by yourself. And that is why you do not conf conform to the patterns of the Lord. Sin can also be defined as lawlessness. A complete disregard of the law of God. 
are missing the mark. It is falling short of the glory of God. Sin is falling short of the glory of God. It is missing God's mark. The mark that the Lord has set for us. It is missing it outrightly and deliberately walking on that way. Choosing you will not conform to his wills. Choosing that you will not do the things that the Lord has done. It is lawlessness. The world has deceived us that laws are made to be broken. That's a lie from the devil. Laws are made to be kept. Objective number two, what is the extent of sin? The extent of sin is captured in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. It says that you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the, uh, and the powers of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you all once lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and where by nature the wrath children of the wrath of God, like the rest of mankind. I will say number one, one, one extent, one thing that has happened because of sin is that man physically and spiritually dies. Man is separated from God. He says that we died. We became dead in our trespasses. Sin has caused man to worship God falsely. Or worship a false God. He says that we were, we, 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 we became and we started following the course of this world. Let me tell you something. Elements that represent this world so perfectly are number one, humanism. Man became so self-centered. We exist to satisfy ourselves, glorify ourselves, me, myself, and I. And that is why the gospel has been twisted to fit me so that people will come here and tell you you will be blessed. You will have cars upon cars. You will have double-double. The kind of songs we are singing, they are not scriptural. They are far from truth. It has made us to coin ourselves in a way that we think we are sufficient enough for ourselves. Actually, God exists to serve you. Sin has deified man. It has made man God. Man has become God for himself. Man does not need God. That is why nowadays you will wake up in the morning Put a selfie on your status and then just write a quote, positive thinking. I think positive, I attract positive things. That's a lie. And then you have the audacity to say, I can create with my mouth. It's a lie. You are not God. Only God creates with his mouth. Man has taken the place of God. Man has exalted himself to be God. Humanism. Things that attract men are things that are all about him. Social media is our, we have made that God. Men, you post a picture and you will not sleep if it has no likes. Why? Because you know the likes, they fan your ego. They massage you so that you feel good about yourself. Ladies are killing themselves nowadays to, to look brown or have some extra meat in places they were not gifted. So that you can attract an attention. So that people will, 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 will applaud you and respect you and look at you and stare at you. Brian Mwashigadi told me, Ini ni chakule amchu. And so we have lived our lives Lives, humanistic lives, me, myself, and I. Look at the 
competition that is in, is, is, is in our society right now. Selfism. That is why the devil, the devil knows what he is doing. When he's introducing good phones that you can take a selfie. He knows to pamper you so that you feel good about yourself. And you think, I do not need anything. Ladies, you have been deceived that you do not need men. At what, what, what a, a, a man can do, the woman can do better. It's a lie from the devil. Selfism. Selfism. Pampering our, our egos so that we feel lifted. So that we feel good about ourselves. Yet losing, losing the very essence of worship of a true God. A God that is jealous and will not share his glory with any other. The Bible says, cast is the man who puts his trust on men. Most of the time we think that it is the other man, but you yourself are a man. And most of the time we have put trust on ourselves. We have become gods for ourselves. Another thing that explains this world right now, it is materialism. We live for the money. We live to have things. We live to amass and possess things for ourselves. That is why God has been reduced to live for us. God exists to bless me. He will satisfy the desires of my heart. He will owe nothing. God does not exist for you. You are too small a thing for God to exist for. Songs that corrupt our theology. Songs that tell us we are a chosen generation. Call forth to show his excellence. How? When you do not know the truth, the depth of the God that has called you. How will you show his excellence if you do not know he's an excellent God? Materialism. We live for the monies. Right now, the reason why some of us are in school is so that you will work and get money and buy cars. And I'm not saying these things are bad. But are you the center or is God the center? Because if God is the center, everything else loses value so that I, I may know him. I consider everything rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing my God. That's the center of the gospel. Christ, the Bible says in Philippians 2, that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But in humility, he became obedient, even obedient to the point of death. He let go. He lived a selfless life. Friends, the gospel is all about selflessness. God does not serve you. You are not God. We have been deceived. Someone's have preached that you are David. You are not David. Your problems are not Goliath. You are not David. You can't be David. Someone's that pamper our emotions and ego to raise ourselves above God. And the only thing we want, we want material things and possession. Another thing, number three, that explains the cause of this world is illicit sex. It is shocking the kind of research we hear about the young people in our country. Young people in our country are sleeping around like goats. Sin. Sin has become our definition. Virginity is nowadays nothing. It is actually considered as stupidity and backwardness. Marriages. It's funny, man. It's funny. It's funny the kind of things we are doing. It's funny the kind of dresses we are dressing. Friends, I tell my people, back at Kahashuge, I tell them this. That the devil had a plan when he had invented those dresses and that show a cleavage and are short. He had a, a plan. So, before you wear them, please sit down and think through. Was this really, is it genuinely? Why, why is it 
honestly, my sister friends, why is it that these ragged trousers only have patches here? Why not here? Why is it that these ragged trousers here? Here? Why not here? The devil knows his, 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 his strategy. He knows his market so well. And he's using it so nicely. Nowadays, sex is funny. Perversion is funny. Men, the things that grieve our God entertain us. So that we will watch Game of Thrones. With no remorse. We will watch Power. With no remorse. We will watch Empire. With no remorse. Because it is nothing. The things that grieve our God have become entertainment to us. And then you'll say, oh, I'm a Christian, I will forward. You are only for watching them fast. You have not done anything. Sin, illicit sin, illicit sex. sex. Sex makes us happy. That is why in our advertisement, even an advertisement that has nothing, nothing to do with the bedroom, there is a lady who has worn a short dress or even undressing. I wonder, have you looked at this advertisement? Ya frame it. Ni mafuta. Na ni mafuta ya kupika. Ni mafuta ya kupika. Viazi. Why is this brother unbuttoning his shirt? Why is the sister licking his, her lips? <laughs> Illicit sex. The devil knows his trade. Listen, friends. The devil knows his, his, his trade. The devil has you. You are consuming his things. He knows you. He knows what you want. And he's presenting them. Look at the posts that we are putting. The pictures that we are uploading in our platforms. Man, if I quote a scripture and talk about the sinfulness of sin, no one, no one will like my post. It will be like, man, guy, when you want to learn one MBs? Oh, oh, what's just going on? But let me just post a picture of a lady's bum. My God. <laughs> comment upon comment. Oh. The devil knows. Knows. He knows his trade. He knows his market. And we are buying it. Christians are selling the devil's commodity. We have become partakers of the devil's commodity. Sin has made us fools. That's another um, continuation of the extent of sin. It has made us fools. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 2, chapter 1 verse 20, 22 and 23, it says this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling immortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. They seemed to be wise in their eyes. They became fools. You have become a fool thinking that you are wise on your own ways without Jesus Christ. You are a fool. That is why scripture has the audacity to say, the, he who says there is no God is a fool. Because when we replace God in our hearts with anything else, we become short-sighted, not seeing the eternal. Friends, let me tell you something. My YOLO peeps, those guys who say you only live once, it's a lie from the devil. You do not live once. The life that you live here determines where you will spend your eternity. So you do not live once, young people. We live a careless life right now. We live a life, carefree life right now. Only to face the consequences of our deeds and our lives in heaven. Sin 
is contrary to the nature of God. It is contrary to his holiness. It questions his holiness. Pastor Jack explained to us. It is contrary to the judgment and the justice of God. It is contrary to the sovereignty of God. It questions whether God is ruler over everything. That is why we would want to break loose and allow ourselves to be entertained by pervert, perverted things. That is why we do not want rules. That is why when we are in church and we are told not to do such and such a thing, you think your pastor is becoming crazy or he is just backward, he does not understand anything. Yeah, that sin ruling in your heart, it questions the sovereignty of God. It questions whether God has or is in control of everything. Sin despises the omniscience of God. It does not see whether God cares. It explains why Adam and Eve would hide when the Lord is asking them, where are you? It questions the omniscience of God. Listen to verse 2 and 3, what it says. It says this, in which you walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in our passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of man. This is what sin does to a man. It is captured in, chapter, in verse 2 and 3. It, it makes a man a beast to his sexuality. It makes a man without control to the things he loves, to his addictions. Sin reduces you to be tied without hope. It makes you a slave to your addictions. That is why some of us are struggling with things because we have chosen to love them above how we love God. We have loved our addictions above how we love God. We have loved and trusted that we are. Mbaka kuna zingine unajitanga hizi ni ni yangu. I know, I know, this is mine. Some of us think that our personalities are anything good. They are not. There is no personality that is saved. All personalities are in men, and man is a sinner, so everything in him becomes corrupted and sinful. So, so for some of us who think because they are quiet and they do not speak a lot, they think they are good people, you are not just a good person. Actually, let me tell you something. The biggest trouble we have right now in churches is good people. Good people are the ones that are taking our ladies from the praise and worship and impregnating them. Because the lady, the lady will just say, man, he was a good guy. He, he's just a good guy. Is he born again? No, he's a good guy. Hell will be full of good people. Hell. Hell will be full of good people. Young person, you're here. Please do not admire to be good. Good people will go to hell. Christ-like people go to heaven. And Christ-likeness is a standard. Listen before you keep, you, listen before you clap and think I'm talking to anyone else other than you. Listen. Listen, listen please, do not allow the devil to bring, to make you, uh, make the other person not to listen and miss a point. You get the point, people? So listen, if you're here and you desire to be a good person, good people will go to hell. Christ-like people, Christ-like people are people that have allowed themselves to be, not to be conformed to the patterns of this world. They are renewed every day, transformed every day. They have died to self and allowed Christ to live. The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 that I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live now, it is by faith for it is Christ who lives in me. Dead bodies have no opinions. Some of us have so many opinions. The, the things we wear. Did God, did, uh, uh, do, do they glorify the Lord? The friends we keep, do they glorify the Lord? The songs we sing, do they glorify the Lord? Sin makes us slaves. It makes us beasts to this world. They, they, 
Do you know a dog? It has no self-control. When you are a sinner, you are just like a dog. That's why the Bible calls you and says that dogs will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you lack self-control, Listen to what chapter, chapter, verse 3 says. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. It says, among whom we all once lived in the passions and the desires of our flesh, carrying out the desires of these bodies and the minds, and, listen to this, by nature, children of wrath. Friends, sin, sin separated us from God. Friends, it is sin. It is God that we sin against. Before you sin against your friend, when you step on them or abuse them, you have sinned against the Lord. You see, some of us do not know this because it has not been preached to us. And again, we do not read scripture. When you sin, you sin against God first and then against my fellow friend. And if you had that in mind, Man, you would love one another. The Bible says this. It says this. They will know us by our love. How? Why would Jesus tell them this? It is because he had presented the truth that if you do anything, you do it to your brother. You, before you do it to your brother, you do it to God. He says, consider others better than yourself. In humility, let there be no selfish ambition, no vain conceit. But in humility, consider others by, better than your uh, yourself. And then he continues and says in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2, let your attitudes be like those ones of Christ. Sin is first against God and then to the fellow man. Another thing that sin has caused, sin has made man an object of God's wrath. Oh, friends, let me tell you something. Oh, the wrath of God is coming upon you if you do not repent and come to him. Oh, let me tell you something. This and the people that have told us that God loves the sinner but hates the sin, that's not true. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 5, verse 5, it says that he hates evildoers. God hates evildoers. The only way the Lord can love us is through his son. Oh, thank you, my brother. He says, arrogance cannot stand in your presence. You hate. You hate. The Lord hates. There's another scripture that says, the, the Lord abhors anyone who does sin. And so this gospel that has, has, has been presented to us, a gospel that says that, oh, oh, please just come as you are. The Lord will accept you. It is true, he will accept you, but you have to change. There is a standard, friends. There is a standard. You cannot continue living in your sinfulness and think you are born again. Romans 2 says that we are the reason why Christ is being profaned by the world. People who claim to be Christians but do not live it out. People who claim to be Christians at work but they do not. You have a Christian name but you do not live like a Christian. Right now if I were to ask how many people are born again, hands will go up. But are you really living out the Christian nature, the Christ-likeness? Are you following the way? The reason why this name came, the name Christian, it was mockery. The apostles are, are mocked in Antioch. They are called the people of the way. Are you following this way? And this way, friends, is narrow. It is narrow. The gate is narrow and the way is narrow and it is the only way. And let me tell you something that I have discovered of, of late. That even in that narrow way, there is a shortcut that will lead you to hell. And some of us have thought we are walking on that narrow way, but we took the shortcut. We have de derived for ourselves a Christianity that only fits what I can accommodate. A God that I can accommodate. A God that does not demand too much for me. Sin promises life and enjoyment only to lead to death and destruction. Friends, you cannot sit at the fence 
you are either on God's side or on the devil's side. What is the remedy of sin? Is there any hope for the sinner? Verse 4 says, but God. Oh, what a statement. It says, but God. Rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, sorry, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised you up from him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming age he may show the immeasurable riches of his grace in Christ. Kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work. Which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Friends, the Bible says there is a remedy and the remedy is God. It was God full of his richness in mercy. Nothing else could, could have paid the debt. Not your good works. And that is why the reformers split from the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church had emphasized a salvation of works. Nothing else. Friends, no amount of goodness can earn you eternity. Nothing Nothing whatsoever. It is a lie to think that you will go visit children's homes so that you can earn eternity for yourself. You will not. Like I said, your acts of kindness are just an extension of your selfishness. You want to create a name for yourself. The Bible says, if you lack love, Love, man. All that you do is nothing. It is only by God that we were saved. So it is right for me to say we are, because I think some of us have been presented a gospel that is not entirely true. Because I know some of us think that the reason why God died, Jesus died on the cross, it was to save us from the devil. That's not true. That's not true. Salvation is Christ saving us from God. So salvation is by God, Christ. He initiated this. It is by God, from God, for God. It has nothing to do with the devil. It has nothing to do with you. He says he will not share his glory with anyone. So don't think the Lord hung on that tree just because of you. You know, those songs that we sing, just for me, just for me. No, no, no. The Bible says it was in obedience. He says he obeyed the Lord to the point of death, even death on the cross. And then, and then when he did that, so that we can marvel at the goodness of God, imagine he would do that he would do that for a sinner like you. That is why it says, when you are in darkness. Because you had not done anything good. Imagine, friends. If when you are lost in darkness, God gave his son for you. Oh my God. So that you may be reconciled to him. It has nothing with making you rich. Nothing, friends. Nothing with making you rich. We reduce the gospel of Jesus Christ to be such a small thing. Honestly, if the Lord would have died to make me rich, oh my, really? The Bible says he owns thousands and thousands of cattle. Did he have to die, pastor? With all those things that he owns, if, if gold makes the roads in heaven, did he have to die? 
And then we have been deceived to that if you are suffering, you are not a Christian or something is wrong with your faith. Really? It's a lie. Man, God does everything for himself. And even for us, for us who suffer right now here, I am sure, I am confident that my suffering is not in vain. It may look in vain for you right now here, but I know, ultimately, when I will be sitting before my Lord and Father, I will understand the reason why he allowed me to go through the things I have gone through. For the young man who's here, who thinks the reason why the prosperity gospel is making sense to you, it is because it connects to your need. Let me tell you something. It just gives you false hope that you cannot stand on. Jesus is the only solid ground that you can stand on. Friends, let me tell you something. When we went to the hospital to have our baby, my wife passed, passed out. And our baby was not breathing. They had pipes. Pipes in my car. One minute baby. Pipes that have so many pipes. And I looked at my wife. And I told the Lord, Lord. I know that ultimately everything happens for good for them that love the Lord. And I had a brother who had accompanied me to the hospital. And I walked out from that delivery room and went to that brother. And I told him, bro, let's just take a walk. And I couldn't talk to him because I was trying to build muscles. How I would tell him, bro, we might actually go home, the two of us today. Because the doctors were shocked. They were in panic calling each other, calling the head surgeons. And Things just weren't good. And you know what gave me hope? It is not the decrees and I de declares. I did not decree and declare anything because I think I humanly have no right to command the Lord. Friends, let's pray biblical prayers. God answers biblical prayers, not opinions and suggestions. I walked out of that room and I told my bro, let's just take a walk. And we walked. And then as we walked for about an hour, I, I, I told the Lord, Lord, you ultimately know what is good for us today. I, I have my will. I would want this to happen to us, to me. But your will, man, your will prevails above everything else. And when I went back home to the delivery room, I found the baby not yet awake. My wife had woken up, asked where the baby is, and fainted again. But let me tell you something. I had hope in him. That him that I trust, when I commit things to him, is able to do. And most of the times when we pray, we pray with our already preconceived idea of what we want these prayers to be. But man, ask friends. They will tell you. It's not the things that they decree and declare that happen. It's the will of God. The Bible says no one can thwart the will of God. Not your decrees, not your declarations, not your commands, nothing. And this is not to tell us that we are living in fatalism where manze God asha muana sisi apana. He tells us to pray. When we pray, we subject ourselves in the authority and the sovereignty of God that things will be done to us according to his will. And he says he will fulfill our desires to make our joy complete. He's not, he's not an unfair God. God is not malicious. But I think we have been presented a God that is very malicious. And we think that, man, he does things. And, and No. God is, and, and I think our God is not fair. Because if you were fair, he would have treated you according to your iniquities and sin and you would be dead. But he's righteous. And that is why when someone stole your phone and you said, why would God, why did you allow my phone to be stolen? The reason why he allowed it is because he just can't punish one sin. He's so just. If you were to punish the thief, you would have to punish the entire world. That's the justice of God that we need to understand, friends. So he does everything for himself. And then the Bible continues and says, his love. Friends, we, for us to understand the love of God, we have to understand him from his righteousness and his holiness so that you know his love is holy. His love is righteous. And that is what costs us to be saved.
it was great love. That even when we were sinners, and notice, it is past sense, even when, so that it has been accomplished for all. Men, the work that Jesus did on the cross was enough and sufficient for all. My time is up. It was sufficient for each and every one of us. And salvation is by grace and grace alone. It is not anything that you can do. You cannot do anything to add on that which was done on the cross. Not your many prayers. Not your service here. Not connecting to the altar. Nothing. It is by grace. Capital letters. Alone. Through faith. And this faith is in two ways. It is a faith of believing. And a faith of relying in the accomplished works. I believe that he did it for me and then I rely on him to sustain me. For it is him who works in me to will and to act according to his good pleasure. It is not by your works. And let me tell you something. Salvation was God's idea. Even during sin. I take you to Please, um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Salvation was God's idea. Even during the fall. See, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Listen, men, most of the time it is the seed of the man that makes sound. But here, when God is saying this, he's talking about Jesus. He's saying that I will put an enmity between the devil, I will put an enmity between everything with the seed of the woman. Who was the seed of the woman? Jesus Christ. That Jesus was prophesied even during the fall. So for some of us to think that God cast us, no. God only had mercy for us. He had mercy on us and he had promised a savior. And it said, it shall bruise his head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Yes, you will, you will mar him. You will hang him on the tree. You will do everything, but he will kill you. He will win. And that is why when Jesus died on the cross, he got victory over death, victory over sin, and victory over the devil. There is hope. And the hope is in Jesus Christ. So then, how do we live in light of this scripture? Number one, be thankful. Be thankful to God that he has loved us to the point of giving his son to die for our sins so that we can be reconciled to himself. Number two, be ready. Be ready to live for him who died so that those who live will not live for themselves, but they will live for him who died and rose again. Be ready to share the gospel, the good news with every person so that his glory will fill the earth like water covers the sea. Number three, be broken. This is to the unconverted sinner. May the Lord revive your heart through these words that you may repent of your sin. Believe in the accomplished work of Christ on the cross that it is by grace through faith, that we are saved unto good works. And rely not on your own ways. Rely on him to sustain you. And at this point I ask, are you here? And you have never given your life to Jesus. And you would want to give your life to Jesus. Are you here? And you have realized that you are a sinner, an object of wrath. And you would want to be reconciled to the Lord. I will ask you to lift up your hands. I will pray for you, and then we will conclude our meeting.